Rishi Sunak this past week became Britain's third prime minister this year alone, replacing Liz Truss and inheriting a range of problems. At 42, the former finance minister is the country's youngest prime minister in 200 years and the first of Asian heritage to hold the post. He succeeds Liz Truss, who he lost to, in a leadership contest in the summer. But after her resignation, a week before the conservative leadership contest, Sunak became the only candidate to, pa to pass a threshold of 100 votes in a ballot of conservative MPs. He had this to say in the wake of his success. Good morning. I've just been to Buckingham Palace and accepted His Majesty the King's invitation to form a government in his name. It is only right to explain why I'm standing here as your new Prime Minister. Right now, our country is facing a profound economic crisis. The aftermath of Covid still lingers. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilised energy markets and supply chains the world over. I want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Liz Truss. She was not wrong to want to improve growth in this country. It is a noble aim. And I admired her restlessness to create change. But some mistakes were made. Not born of ill will or bad intentions. For a bit of focus on what may become of Nigeria's bilateral relationship with Britain. Following this change of guards at 10 Downing Street and indeed other jurisdictions in this part of the world, we are now being joined from Arise Abuja studio by Ambassador Joe Keshe, a former permanent secretary to Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Ministry and a one time Consul General at Nigeria's Foreign Mission in Atlanta. Welcome to the program, Ambassador, Ambassador Keshe. Good to have you again on the program. Thank you. Good evening, Ruben, and happy, new, happy Sunday. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Keshi. Well, the other week, last week, in fact, we were discussing British uh, politics. Since then, we now have in place a new prime minister. What has been described by some persons as a rise of Rishi Sunak. The rise that is so uh, important that he didn't even have to go through an election, compelling some people to say, well, it was a coronation. Because Boris Johnson withdrew from the race. Uh, Penny Mordaunt also uh, withdrew from the race. And of course, Lee Strauss was advised by the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, to step down, and she did. So we have King Charles uh, having uh, Two prime ministers in less than in less than uh, a month. But what do you make of this latest development in the United Kingdom? Well, look, um, Ruben, you remember last week I did say that um, uh, Richie will become the prime minister, and uh, it has come to pass. And obvious, it was actually obvious to almost uh, uh, everybody. Uh, that was following the development in uh, Great Britain. What has happened is true to the tradition of the, uh, of the British system. And, and um, we should just look forward to see how uh, the new prime minister can address some of the problems uh, that brought him to, to office. You did say that he didn't go through an election. Ruben, I also want to add that uh, he did not even pay Pay. He did not even spend so much to become prime minister. If he spent a lot, he, I mean, if he spent at all, he only spent a few uh, pounds in making phone calls to his colleagues to seek for their support, you know. And as against how much we in this country are going to spend, you know, in our own, uh, in our own uh, election. And when you, when you look at what he has said, Ruben, it's very interesting. And I, and I think that um, 
this is what we should listen to that speech. It's a very inspiring speech, but it also has some uh, meanings and significance and relevance to the Nigerian situation. Let me start by the first thing he said. He admitted that mistakes were made by his predecessors. And he, took, he undertook to make repairs. In this country, no candidate competing for election today has apologized to the Nigerian people for what has uh, you know, gone wrong uh, in the country. Although I heard uh, Mr. Peter Obi said to you on your program that he will make an apology, you know, that there's a lot of apologies to be made in this country, uh, as according to Mr. Peter Obi, but uh, those running and who created this problem have not even admitted that mistakes were made, talk less of, you know, uh, making amends. He also said something that was interesting. He spoke of integrity, restoring integrity back to gover go governance. He was referring to his former boss. Um, Boris Johnson. Uh, jo Boris Johnson. Yes, he was referring to Boris Johnson on, on the issues of integrity, accountability, and, uh, and, and transparency. Again, I make the point that um, in this country today, we are having an election, and some people believe the issue of integrity, accountability, and, uh, and transparency should not be, or character. Should not, be, uh, should not be part of the election. So you see a new prime minister in the United Kingdom apologizing to the people for the mistakes that have been made. On the contrary, those who are trying to run for office and who were part and parcel of successive governments are not even apologizing to the Nigerian people. They are actually saying that they are going to double down on what has been happening in this country before. You see him raising the issue of transparency and integrity. And some people will come, particularly on your, on your channel, and say that character doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, my principal has uh, the ability to do A, B, C, D, uh, and, the, and that's the most important thing. And so I just think that, uh, as I've always said to people, if you don't know what to do, watch television. If Nigerian leaders, if Nigerian politicians watch that uh, speech or listen to that speech or care to read that speech, they'll probably learn a few things about leadership, that a leader should come out, be honest to the people, admit that mistakes have been made, and undertake to change or to repair or to you know, do something different. And this is what is significant about this uh, you know, young fellow. And my last comment on that, uh, you know, it's about the young people. Richie, came to, Richie stood for an election seven years ago and got into parliament. And within seven years, he's become the prime minister of the United Kingdom. The young people all over this country are running around collecting money from uh, people and coming on television to defend the indefensible. I mean, I think this is tragic for this country because when I listen to some of the young people on television today defending what they should be fighting against, I, I begin to wonder whether they, they know what they are talking about and whether you know, there is redemption in this country. Well, Ambassador Keshi, in his first full day in office, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak uh, just abandoned, tore apart the legacy of uh, Liz Truss, if it's possible to talk about a legacy in 49 days, the shortest seven ever Prime Minister in the history of uh, Great Britain. And he says, look, Britain faces a profound crisis and difficult decisions will have to be taken. Now he has moved the presentation of the uh, fiscal plan, the budget cutting uh, strategy, from October 31, from Halloween to November 17. He has uh, reversed his, uh, the position of the Liz Truss administration on the pension uh, triple lock. He has said that uh, there will be uh, cuts, heavy spending cuts, in order to uh, block the black hole of uh, between 35 a uh, billion pounds and uh, 50 billion pounds. He has uh, reversed the position on fracking and all of that. All in one day. The markets have responded positively. Borrowing costs have gone down. But for how long do you think he can sustain? Do you think this is sustainable? Or in the long term, he himself may run into troubled water? Well, it's possible, Ruben, that he could run into uh, some troubled waters given the economic situation of the United Kingdom.
But here is my, the deal for me. A leader must come out clean with the people from day one. And look, it's normal when a new leadership comes to power to reverse some decisions that were not popular or some decisions that in the first place or instance created crisis, you know, uh, uh, for, his, uh, for his predecessor. And so this is exactly what, uh, you know, he has done and correctly too in my view. So that enables him now to put in place, you know, his own policies, you know, that people believe is probably what, I mean, uh, what the, you know, uh, the United Kingdom needs at this time in place. Secondly, with regards to postponing the, um, uh, the date of a new budget to later in the, in, the, in, the, in the new month, again, that's the right thing to do. That enables him and the Treasury Secretary to sit down and take a comprehensive review of how to address the, all the problems, I mean, the financial situation in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom. So I think that this is the right way to go. And until he announces the new um, policies, we are not too sure exactly what will happen. But look, like I said before, those who want to come to office or those who want to assume office after election should come up clean from the day, from day one of their campaign. So let's know the policies you will change and let's know the policies uh, you will retain. This is very important. And I think he's been forthright with the people of Great Britain by making, by making sure that they are aware of where he stands. So in jettisoning the policies of... Um, of uh, the, the last prime minister Mistrust. and uh, Boris Johnson, He's, he wants to set his yes, Mistrust. He wants to set his own course and take responsibility in case anything goes wrong, and that's the normal thing to do anywhere in the world. Look, there's an election holding today, I believe, in Brazil. You don't expect uh, Lula to continue with uh, uh, if he wins the election. Bolsonaro. Lula will certainly not continue yes, with Bolsonaro. the policies of the Bolsonaro with the policies of yes of the current president, Bushanaru. Just like Biden did not continue with the policies of uh, Biden, a lot was changed. And so this is a point, this is, a pro, this is exactly my point I was making earlier. I believe that any, any of the candidates that win the next election is going to drastically move away from a number of Buhari's policy. But they are so scared of mentioning exactly that they will do that. Instead, APC says they will double down on it. PDP is promising something different. And the only fellow who seems to be making a difference in between, again, you know, interestingly, is a Labour you know, candidate. So we just wait and see exactly what happened. But changing policies, it's uh, the right of a new regime. Okay, there's been some race baiting since Mr. Sunak assumed office. The most prominent, perhaps, being uh, uh, the uh, television uh, you know, anchor, uh, Trevor Noir, the South African, on his daily, the Daily Show, um, making jokes about race and all of that. Although he said he, he wasn't saying that all British persons are racist, but uh, he said some people, and uh, Sajid Javid and others, uh, they've said, look, you are totally wrong. This is not about race. But of course, people have also made the point beyond uh, Trevor Noir that this new prime minister is brown. This new prime minister is an Asian. Uh, is this about multiculturalism, uh, talent, or is the race factor a big issue? Or it's a question of let the best man do the job? Uh, Ruben, it's a combination of it all. It's a combination of it all. Look, let's not run away from the facts. The first question, why was Rishi rejected in the first instance by the Conservative Party when they voted. He was leading in the polls. He had the best policy that uh, people were discussing, but he lost. Why did he lose? On the day of voting, what did, uh, you know, some of the you know, conservative people took a look at the two candidates and they saw different faces and they, they made their decision. For me, it's a combination of <laughs> all the factors, but look, um, Trevor was, uh, Trevor Noah was very correct, uh, although he was making a joke of it all, but everything he said was apt. Everything he said was correct. It's race, 
it's a competence, it's, uh, you just name it. Everything was involved in the selection of uh, uh, Richie. Well, Ambassador, I know you've talked about lessons that we can learn from uh, Great Britain, about integrity and accountability, about the clarity of purpose, about a new leader uh, presenting his own program because he has that clarity of purpose. Are there other lessons that we can learn from what has just happened in Great Britain, particularly with regard, as some people have pointed out, the system of government, because it's a parliamentary uh, system, about institutions, as we had uh, previously discussed. As we go into 2023, uh, if we could just go over those lessons that our politicians can learn. You've made the point about Rishi Sunak not spending money to get to that position, even when he's, a, he's almost a billionaire, they even say he's richer than the king of, of, uh, of uh, England. Over to you, sir. Yes, uh, Rich, uh, I, because, because your name starts with an R, I was almost calling you Richie as well. well listen, uh, maybe I was only in Nigeria listen, someday. Listen, uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's too late for you, my brother. <laughs> Uh, listen, <laughs> listen. Let, let me just uh, refer to your last, uh, you know, to your last interview uh, with uh, uh, Chiazo over the CBN and the Ministry of Finance and the, you know, change of the dollar. Particularly what you said about the uh, the ESCC, you know, uh, preparing to go to the um, commercial banks and you know and arrest people coming with bag of uh, money. There are reports in a number of uh, platforms that already people are changing huge sums of money and how they bureau the change. <laughs> so by the time the ESCC gets to the banks, the, you know, the horse has been let out of the, you know, uh, because oh. people are going to bureau the, the, the change. Uh, and this makes it very imperative. Well, when you are developing policies like this, that all arms of government that are to be involved in that policy need to consult. The problem here now is already, the, 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 whatever it was intended to achieve, maybe it was intended to achieve A, B, C, D, including, you know, stopping people from holding so much money, already part of it is already um, being addressed, I mean, uh, it's failing because people are already going to uh, the parallel market to exchange their money. And so the part of the lessons we should learn in this country, very simple. We do not need strong men as people are promoting. We need to build very strong and capable institutions. The problem is that our institutions are just too weak these days, you know, to be able to do a couple of things. And so the first thing we need to do, we need to build very strong institutions, including the political parties. When you look at what's going on in, it, in uh, all the political parties, except the, the smaller ones, you know, you see instability, you know, quarrels and the sort of it. But look at what happened in how many days, you know, these guys have resolved the, the issue of uh, when the prime, the, uh, Mrs. Truss resigned. It took them about four or five days. They've resolved the leadership issue and they have a new prime minister. And you know, we, we discussed this the last time, and my position was that where we are today, it's probably too late, too, too late to go back to the parliamentary system. So what we need to do is to make the presidential system work as it's working where we copied, uh, uh, the, where we borrowed from, because substantial part of it is borrowed from the United States uh, Constitution. So we need to develop the character, the competence, the discipline, to, to run that uh, presidential, uh, you know, that presidential uh, system. So first thing first we need to do, make our institutions strong and not begin again to have strong leaders. Look, since the military period, our institutions have grown weaker and weaker because of the nature of, the, of what the military left behind. And you know, the military is hierarchical in nature. And so power comes from the top and from the military era, significant changes were made in the administration of this country. 
The president virtually took all the powers and, uh, you know, including the powers of the ministers. The ministers took quite a chunk from the powers of the permanent secretaries. Permanent secretaries took quite a chunk from the powers of directors. So you go to a number of ministries, it's even worse in the states. Go to any state the days that there are no lights and the windows are open. You see people sleeping. And when you say to them, what's going on? They say to you, we have nothing to do. It shows you how weak our system is. So we need to build that institution. We need to also begin to see how other systems work and see whether there's something we can borrow. But you know what? We also need to change the characters of the operators of the system because it is very difficult when the same people continue to manage the system. You don't expect any change. So one way or the other, we must find a way to get rid of those who seize power in 1999 and begin to bring a new breed of politicians into the equation. But the unfortunate thing here, you know, which is a point I made before, seven years, seven years after joining parliament, Richie Sugnas is a prime minister of Great Britain. And yet, the same number of Nigerian youths who've been screaming, fighting all over the place that it is time for to listen to the youths, the youths must, you know, must uh, be given the opportunity. I think they better learn that nobody gives you the opportunity that you must seize the opportunity. The women who have been screaming that we must be carried along should realize that nobody carries you along if you are not at the table where these decisions are being made. Nobody is going to come to your house and play or carry you, you know, carry you along. And that reminds me to say, because I think on your program the other day, somebody was boasting that uh, uh, APC, or, you know, APC now has a women's, uh, women's wing. It is the worst thing that can happen to women in this country and the women in that party. Because the decisions are being made at the, where the men are meeting and no decision will be made where the women are meeting. If women in APC, I believe it was the APC or was it the PDP, if they are sensible, they should just dissolve that women council and go and join the women council. The main presidential council is where the women should be. They should not create their own parallel uh, council. That's how the men, you know, throw them out of the main decision-making uh, system. So the point I'm making is, in the last three or four weeks, we've had a lady as a British prime minister. We've now had an Indian who came to parliament in seven years. Look, we should begin to think seriously, particularly the young ones in this country. And the question should be, what the hell are we doing to ourselves in this country? Well, Ambassador, just before we go, let me ask you a question. You are in Abuja there. Abuja at, the, at this moment is uh, been said by the UK mission in Nigeria, the US mission in Nigeria, the Australians, the Canadians, not to be safe. Hence, a terror alert. And there's panic here and there. Uh, some establishments are, are shutting down. Uh, even Julius Berger has issued his own internal travel advisory, advising its uh, workers to, to keep safe. The uh, U.S. is withdrawing uh, workers that are not involved in any uh, essential service. But the Nigerian government, speaking through uh, Lai Mohammed, the Minister of Information and Culture, says no, people should not worry. And that, in fact, the, the, these uh, foreigners, they have no business uh, causing panic in Nigeria because Nigeria has never been uh, uh, safer than now. What do you say to that? Uh, is this about sovereignty? Or, you know, we need to uh, pay attention to these travel alerts or security alerts from missions you know, in Nigeria. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I think, be, let me start because you mentioned the Minister of Information. I think he created more panic, you know, than anybody else. And uh, the, the lesson from this is that next time, the, the Minister of uh, Information should allow the security agencies to deal with this matter you know, and I think they are doing reasonably well uh, so far from uh, the things they've set out. But look, Ruben, uh, uh, I came into Abuja late last night, and I can tell you for sure that the, the interesting thing I found out is that uh, people in Abuja don't appear to be listening to anybody. 
they are going about their normal, you know, uh, businesses. Uh, as I drove home last night, uh, the streets were, you know, the nightlife was beginning to to kick up. And I and I said to uh, my colleague that we we're traveling together, I said, "This is interesting. People are not even listening to the security alert." And he said to me, "Look, nobody takes this thing seriously. You can see how crowded the streets are at about 10 p.m. last night." So that just tells you that the people are not, you know, are not listening. But look, to be candid, I think mistakes were made by almost everybody, but particularly by traditional, uh, traditional friends. You know, um, I know for sure that there's a cooperative relationship between all the agencies, not just in this country, but all over the world. You know, they all work together. They share information. To, you know, to, together, they pass messages to, you know, to one another. So I have no doubt in my mind that messages were passed, you know, to our own people as such, you know. And um, I think that what our people should have done in the first instance was to have almost immediately stay on top of the situation, which I believe they probably do. But they must also learn to communicate with the people. They communicated. Remember, there was a a terror alert, I think, in uh, April, if I'm right, or March. Then there was another one in May or something like that. So immediately this information came to them. They probably could have done the same thing and work with them to manage the situation without anybody getting in and criticizing, you know, I, um, your partners who are also providing you this information. Because the truth of the matter, if you know how the security agencies around the world, you know, uh, operate, not only do they share information, I mean, uh, in terms of information sharing, because they all have mechanisms to, li uh, to listen, you know, and they have things that they see that the rest of us are not seeing. And these they share among themselves. So anytime this information is shared, I think it should be properly, you know, handled. And those who are not involved in the management of security, in my view, should stay out of it rather than create more panic. And you know, when somebody comes to you and says this is going to happen, and they see you are not taking the kind of action they think you should take, and somebody comes on air and starts criticizing them, talking of uh, sovereign rights and things like that, their first reaction is to take care of themselves. And the whole idea of even making this information you know, available was to actually prepare the ground that uh, if it gets worse, they just have to leave this country. And this is not the first country they will live in, you know, under such circumstances. But the truth of the matter is that for those of us in Abuja, life goes on as normal, and Nigeria's situation is not as bad or worse than a number of uh, other countries. And I think this is why citizens of Abuja have quietly ignored uh, you know, you know, uh, the alerts and have continued with their life. But I'll say this as my conclusion to your question. During the Civil War, the language or the slogan of the, of the, of the Biafrans was very simple. The price of eternal liberty is vigilance. And I just think that Nigerians should be vigilant, you know, particularly at this time. Whether we like the alerts or not, the most important thing is for us to be vigilant and to watch out. If we see something, we should help the security forces by saying something. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Joe Kashi, for joining us on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show today.